Welcome, everyone, to an extraordinary podcast slash live video streaming experience presented by FentanylSolution.org in collaboration with the compassionate minds at the Fentanyl Solution Group. Get ready for engaging conversations, expert insights. Welcome to Fentanyl Solution, advocating for lives, inspiring change. Hello, everyone, and thank you for listening to Fentanyl Solution syndicated podcast and live stream. I'm Janice M. Celeste, your host and president and CEO of FentanylSolution.org and the Fentanyl Solution Group. We are a nonprofit organization based in Orange County, Florida, but we are national. I want you to tell your followers about the show, share the link. After all, sharing is caring. The replay will be available after the broadcast. Know that our hashtag for the show is hashtag fentanyl solution. Fake pills laced with potentially fatal fentanyl are a huge problem when it comes to buying pharmaceuticals like Percocet, Xanax, Adderall, and more, especially on the black market. Um, you know, you can get these pharmaceuticals legitimately from your doctor, but when you go to a friend or a dealer, these pills are pressed to look just like the pills you want, but they have no medicine, just usually some sort of fentanyl and filler or they're cross-contaminated with fentanyl. But you would never expect a brick and mortar pharmacy to sell counterfeit pills, yet that's precisely what's happening right across the border. My guests today are Adam Octor from Bunk Police, which manufactures fentanyl test strips, and Deborah Bonello, a journalist who is from Vice, and she recently reported on fentanyl lace pills from Mexican uh, pharmacies. So I want to know, can we bring these guys out? I want to know whose idea it was uh, to uh, do this story in the first place and how did it come about? Uh, sure, yeah, I suppose it was my idea. Um, you know, I had, had suspicions that this was going on down in Mexico for a little while now, a few years. You know, we're seeing these counterfeit Mexican pills in the U.S. all the time. And uh, there was a academic study earlier this year that, you know, kind of revealed the fact that this could be a problem, um, not just in border towns, but, you know, across the country. So, you know, we decided to go down there and, you know, see exactly what was going on and gather some evidence and present it to the public so we can, you know, hopefully steer people away from these pharmacies. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, Adam reached out to me through a, a mutual friend um, and the academic study that he mentioned that was done by UCLA, I think it was released in times on the issue but um as, as you know vice is a very we're very focused on organized crime and drug related violence in the region and i felt like a lot of the reporting had really left out the sort of cartel angle you know they went as far as to say that those bricks and mortar pharmacies were selling those pills but i was really curious as to how they were getting into the supply chain and and the way that they were being sold etc so when adam reached out to me and told me he was going down to some of the coastal towns to do um, some buying. I, I volunteered to go with him. Um, and yeah, it was kind of a joint pill buying effort combined with a, a bunch of interviews. And um, we weren't we weren't disappointed, were we, Adam? Not at all. No. So you found pills laced with fentanyl in the pharmacies in Mexico, and they have a link to the cartel. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, we, we, we found, not only did we find um, pills that were being sold as oxys and hydrocodone with no, uh, with no prescription needed, but we also found um, pills being sold as um, Adderall, that none of which was Adderall. I mean, I think, Adam, none of the pills that we tested for Adderall actually had Adderall. They were all counterfeit right. and all, yeah. all, all meth, basically. Um, <laughs> and, wow. What was striking about the pills were they were they were sold. Most of them were sold in these little bottles with English package, English language packaging, mentioning pharmaceutical companies that were tied to um, major pharmaceutical companies. But there was no, you know, they were all being sold in Mexico. There was no um, sort of stamp or serial number from the Mexican uh, health industry. Like as soon as you saw the bottle, you know that you knew that they were. That they were fake, um, which 
also kind of begs the question on why nothing's being done about them. You know, any inspector from the Mexican sanitation agency who would see those bottles would know that they were not either legally produced or legal for sale in Mexico, which are, which is kind of a double whammy. Mm -hmm. Well, so Adam, you use the test strips that um, you manufacture to test for fentanyl. Did it also tell you what drugs are in it or is it just uh, to let you know that fentanyl is present? Sure, yeah, we did some prelim preliminary testing down there in Mexico using the test strips that we sell and also different test kits. And yeah, you can um, not only detect fentanyl, but also you know different cutting agents as well. And so we, uh, from there, brought the pills back to the US and then sent them over to Spain for full analysis in a laboratory using some pretty advanced equipment. And Adam, what was the other substance you found in, in one of the pills? Uh, xylazine, which has been making the rounds recently. Yeah. So there was one oxycodone, or I think maybe two oxycodone pills that also had xylazine in addition to fentanyl, which is incredibly dangerous. This is so scary. And, now, and it's scary because there's a lot of medical tourism that happens in Mexico, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and and I, I'm just taken aback because xylazine, for the people who are listening that don't know, you may have heard it called Trank or the zombie drug. Um, it is a really potent and um, there's no uh, antidote to bring you back from an overdose from xylazine. Uh, fentanyl, we have naloxone, which many people know as Narcan. Cloxado is uh, our sponsor for um, naloxone, but um, there's nothing for xylazine overdoses. And what is that scary because people are thinking they're getting their medication for cheap. How easy is it to get these pharmaceuticals in Mexico Incredibly. in the pharmacies? Yeah, you just walk really? in and ask. Yeah, many times they'll even have a menu and, there and for it, you. A menu, yeah. wow. And yeah. these are regulated yeah. usually in the United States, but but not in Mexico, or are they regulated in Mexico and they, they are, just- Yeah, um, they are regulated. They are regulated. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, they're breaking laws in order to do this, but it's it's very widespread. I mean, technically, I Mexican pharmacies are regulated by an agency called Cofepris, which is supposed to carry out inspections. Um, the the U.S. State Department and the DEA have 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 registered this problem with the Mexican administration. Um, you may or may not know that the bilateral security relationship between um, Mexico and the U.S. is pretty pretty bad right now. Um, mm -hmm. And even though that warning has been running, and there are a number of sort of State Department warnings to the, to American tourists in Mexico about this problem, nothing has been done, um, mm -hmm. which isn't surprising to me, and probably isn't surprising to you either. Um, but it was it was astonishing how easy the meds were to get hold of like we would walk into places and they would sort of say no we can we can only sell you a bottle we can't sell you loose pills and then then they would sell us loose pills if we told them that we didn't want the whole bottle like it was it was super easy no that's amazing i mean it does just it's mind-boggling to me yeah that, that can even happen yeah it, it um, gets a little bit more extreme from there um you know we, we were even offered you know, bulk pills in the in the thousands, up to ten thousand pills um, were offered without even asking at, at certain pharmacies. It is it is definitely quite the industry down there. This is it's, it's, it's probably worth emphasizing that the people who are who are interested in buying those sorts of pills are very much foreign tourists. Mexico has not had sort of an opioid crisis or, or epidemic the way that we've seen in the U.S. and it doesn't have a sort of pill culture the way that the U.S. does, you know, like with this kind of high demand for Xanax and anxiety medication and Adderall, Mexican society like is not sort of that way inclined. So it's important to to know that even though I think there is a big trade in these pills, it's very much aimed at English speaking tourists and mostly American right. Canadians. Well, Absolutely. I know I've heard of uh, senior citizens that would cross the border to get their prescriptions because they were more affordable across the border. What's the difference in price if it was legit? Like, uh, I mean, it's it's how affordable is it versus what you usually would pay in the States for, say, a Percocet? 
Uh, well, I guess the street price is, is somewhat similar to what they're charging in these pharmacies. The street U.S. price yeah. is, is somewhat similar. I see. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it, yeah, it's different than if you were to have it covered by insurance or something like that, of course, but pretty similar price. Right. We recently did a, uh, a, a infographic on how senior citizens are now being affected by think it's like this and, and that they're not um, stereotyped as a, a person who would be addicted. So a lot of times they fall through the cracks from by their doctors and they don't know. Mm -hmm. And then to add this to it, they're thinking of getting medicine, um, that it, there's no medicine in it. Um, and Adderall here in the United States, you know, we have a shortage. So this sets up kind of a perfect storm if people don't know uh, and they're trying to get their Adderall from the street um, or from crossing the border. This really sets them up to become addicted or, or possibly even for death. Uh, we know how lethal fentanyl can be, especially when you don't, don't have a tolerance built up for it. But let me talk to, talk to you a little bit about uh, the cartels because um, Deborah and Adam, they, that, they are dangerous. Um, and what you did was is pretty dangerous, no? <laughs> yeah, the, I, I could see that yeah. perception. Yeah, I think we, we were pretty confident. Um, you know, we, we've been doing this for a little while. Uh, yeah, I they, would say brave. You're <laughs> very brave. Oh, thank you. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. Um, so there was an incident, no, that when you went into one of the pharmacies, can you talk about that a little bit? Because this just talks to you, to me about your bravery to, overall. Sure. Yeah. So um, for the first half of the trip or so, I was uh, going to these pharmacies with a, a hidden camera and you know, recording these interactions. And so um, I, I suppose at some point, uh, we were actually able to kind of figure out when it was on the footage, but at some point they identified the hidden camera and there, I guess, was a call that went out to the pharmacies in the area. Um, so the next day I walked into one of these pharmacies and the pharmacist, um, you know, he pretty quickly said that they didn't have the substances that I was looking for. And then when I was walking out of the pharmacy, they, uh, they told me that he said that they would cut my head off. And so I turned around and I kind of confronted him about this. I asked him who would cut my head off, what he was talking about, and he, he got pretty nervous and um, he didn't really say anything else. But we do have that entire interaction on uh, hidden camera footage and that will be in the documentary we're working on. Awesome, I'm glad to hear that you're doing a documentary on this because uh, I'll definitely be watching and I, I think it's very interesting uh, to see how this plays out. And besides that, it's going to get the word out to, to people. So that's a great idea. Um, I think I think what also um, raised the alert for organized crime where we were doing the research was when conversation came up around bulk buying. Because I think these pills that are being sold out of Mexican pharmacies, especially the Mexican blues, which you've probably seen, they have an M30 printed on them. Mm -hmm. These are the same pills that DEA is detecting up and down the east and west coast of the US and, and all over, really. And I think the way that those pills are getting into the American street drug market are through traditional like trafficking. You know, they're, they're seizing hundreds of thousands of pills at the US-Mexico border. Um, and then those pills are being sort of sent now to other parts of Mexico to capitalize on this, this market that we're talking about. Um, and I think I think those pills, when they're trafficked to the US, they're bought in bulk. So what if, if Adam was was asking, was this were having conversations about bulk buying, they probably suspected that he was a trafficker of some sort who they hadn't identified and they didn't have an agreement with. And that's probably what what set off the red light for them, as well as the fact that, you know, even if um say a Purdue or another pharmaceutical major was producing pills that were being sold in Mexico, they, they wouldn't be adulterated. I mean, the adulterated nature of the pills, and this is the whole point that the bunk police even exists, is, is that you have, you have no idea what, what's in them. And that is obviously the risk of buying those pills in the US. But um, unless I'm wrong, Adam, and correct me, I think that these pills are only for sale on the streets of the US. So the people who are buying them absolutely know that they're probably not legit. And, mm -hmm. you know, those who can, 
will test them before they use them. But the fact that they're being sold out of bricks and mortar pharmacies in Mexico means that many people will justifiably assume that they are produced by legitimate pharmaceutical companies and won't contain any adulteration. And that is, I think, the major factor here that A, poses a danger to people and B, flags the involvement of the cartels. Wow. Okay. That, so we have to assume that the cartels are purposely doing this since you found meth in, in them as well. It's not cross-contamination, right? It's a no, purposeful it's no. No. thing that they're trying to do to get people addicted, right? That's what, is that the reason? Oh, that could be one reason. Uh, what these else? These are also just cheaper generally than the legitimate versions. Um, they're also easier to manufacture for the cartels. The precursors for certain substances uh, are difficult and the synthesis is difficult for something like oxycodone. It's more difficult for Adderall than it is for methamphetamine. So it's, it's just an easier, cheaper route for them. Okay. And, you know, remember so, that the, the, the aim of the cartels, um, they, they are not sort of ideological companies trying to build following like they're, they're they're sort of these capitalist beasts that are just trying to make as much money and profit as they can with the lowest level of investment mm -hmm. which is why these pills are filled with stuff that's you know cheaper than what they're claiming to be and is gonna sort of you know make them give as close to the desired effect but as we saw from recent indictments released by the united states government there is evidence that suggests that the cartels in Mexico test the fentanyl they produce on humans in Mexico before they put it into pills to make sure, you know, to, to see how deadly it is and how potent it is. Um, so you have to bear in mind that, like, they're just, you know, they're trying to make money. Ultimately, they don't really care what the consequences of the consumption of these pills are, which in a way differentiates them from the pharmaceuticals, at least theoretically. Um, because they don't, you know, the pharmaceuticals do have to answer to someone, you know, whether they answer enough and whether they've paid the consequences enough is, is, is a matter of opinion. But the, the pharmaceuticals are, you know, these legitimate companies that have some level of accountability, whereas the cartels, um, you know, it's all about profit. Mm -hmm. So in your opinion, as far as medical tourism, because I know there are companies um, that will... Uh, you know, send people and down to uh, Mexico to get everything from st um, stomach, not stomach stapling anymore. I don't know what they call it, but, you know, weight reduction types of surgeries to uh, dental work. So it's reg these prescriptions are regulated. How much do people have to worry about um, going to a center to get this done and maybe not getting legitimate drugs to treat their pain? Is this something they should be concerned about? Yeah, I mean, I'd say it is a concern. Right. Uh, it could easily, you know, yeah. just kind of make its way in some of the legitimate supply. Um, all it takes is just going to the wrong pharmacy, you know, prescription or not, mm -hmm. and you could end up with something adulterated. I see. Okay. And then what about um, people who uh, are going down there to get like heart medicine? It just no medicine, basically, you yeah. shouldn't trust anything from these pharmacies. No, I, w I wouldn't trust it. Absolutely okay. not. Um, we are considering looking into other substances as well that are that are being sold down there to kind of uncover a little bit more of this product or this problem um, beyond just the narcotics angle. Okay. And so, um, Deborah, like, what? Um, I mean, what advice would you give to um, just our listeners who may have crossed the border to? get what they think is le legitimate medication because they're seniors. I'm worried, really worried about the seniors because I know I've seen them go on bus tours down um, to get medicine like their heart medicine and, and because they can't afford it here. Is there, I mean, what can we tell them? Just don't go, right? Don't do it. What would you say? To I them? mean, I, I think the safest thing to say is don't do it because any pharmacy that is a willing to sell you medications of that strength that are prescription only any pharmacy that's prepared to sell you those meds without a prescription should 
be like a massive red red alert. The fact that they're willing to sell loose pills that don't come in a blister packet or a bottle, um, another major, major red flag for me. And the fact that, you know, if you're in Mexico, why are you buying pills that have packaging that's in English? Like, it, again, it doesn't really make any sense. And like, in the way that in the US, you would probably look for the, either the FDA badge or whatever it is that um, those kinds of medications have, like, none of those bottles have that, that affirmation and that stamp of approval. Um, it's, it's a long list of why they're so dangerous. So I think it's best just to say that um, you should be skeptical and dubious of any prescription meds that you buy without a prescription. That would be that would be more warning. What what we did know is that there there are some very major pharmacy chains in Mexico, like Walgreens and, and other things that you see in the U.S. That the equivalent of those in Mexico that would not sell us these meds that aren't involved in this kind of thing. So, I would say you know just don't buy from those mom and pop small pharmacies you know get buy from the major chains and and if they if they sell without a prescription don't buy it that's that's good advice now because of reporting like yours there is a travel advisory um now what is it it just says don't buy from these pharmacies is that what it is so um people who are listening check your travel advisory too and this is all good advice do not buy any pills from any pharmacy in mexico unless you said like it's a big chain um, and that's considered safe. Well, let me ask you, was there anything that really surprised you uh, while doing this story? And both of you can answer if you have a, a different surprise. Like what really surprised you doing this? Uh, Deborah, you look like you have something <laughs> you want to say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're, pro we're probably both thinking of, of similar things. I'll let you go first, Deborah. I mean, when we we when we were doing the 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 pill buying, I was with sometimes with Adam and sometimes with another colleague of us who looked like you're sort of, I think it's fair to say he looked like a sort of, you know, your standard surfer guy, you know, very American looking, blonde hair, blue eyes. And when we were in places like um, Plan El Carmen and uh, Tulum, people would approach us and offer us Coke and whatever else they think that American tourists buy. You know, these are sort of illegal street dealers. And then we would go, you know, with them wherever we were going to do the deal. And if you're, if I asked them for Oxys or Xanax, they would be willing to sell those too. So I think I was, I was quite a surprised by how sort of the illegal and legal market are blurring in the way that you've seen in the US too, you know, um, and how the sort of street level drug dealers are, are innovating as well and like getting hold of those pills because they understand that the only people that are, are asking for them are Canadian and American tourists who arguably have much more disposable income than your average Mexican drug buyer. That that was the surprising thing to me. I don't know. I don't know what stood out for you, Adam. Yeah, no, I mean, that was absolutely surprising um, just to see that. And I mean, the, the real shock for me was just the level of adulteration, you know, going down there, I expected to see maybe one in 10 pills, one in 20 pills as positive for fentanyl or positive for methamphetamine, but it ended up being the vast majority. And that was a complete and utter shock. Yeah, there was a moment where we were doing some testing in our in the hotel room that all of all of us, I don't think we surprised, I don't think we expected to find quite as much adulteration in what was what was quite a small batch of pills at the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, the story was amazing. I, I highly uh, recommend that if you haven't uh, read the stories for the people who are listening and watching to find it, it's under, you know, you can find it under Deborah's name and vice. Um, and it's, it's just really an interesting read. So you mentioned, um, Adam, a doc documentary. What's, is that what's next? What should we expect? Yeah, that's what's, that's what's next. We're, uh, you know, currently in the process of filming interviews. We're also uh, lining up um, some, additional undercover type things um, that, you know, that will kind of add to the story. And uh, yeah, we've, we've also, you know, found some really interesting people to talk about uh, or talk to uh, when it comes to these issues. Uh, for instance, a mother that lost her son near the Mexican border from adulterated Percocet. Um, 
but yeah, we're, you know, we're hoping to get everything wrapped up pretty quickly and, uh, you know, get this uh, in front of people as fast as we can to try and change public perception of these pharmacies as much as possible. I, I was going to say, actually, Janice, something you might be able to help us with is we are trying to find people who have bought these pills in Mexico and then gone home and taken them and either overdosed or gotten very sick from them. The, the problem that I think U.S. law enforcement has is, A, they don't have jurisdiction in Mexican pharmacies, so there's very little that they can do about that from the U.S. And B, there are so many of these pills already in the U.S. You know, these are the, the same pills that are being bought off the street. It's hard to, you know, once those pills are in, in people's hands, it, only those people know where they got them from. So we're looking for people who came to Mexico or had friends come to Mexico, bought these pills, took them home, and then um, had problems with them. Um, and we've tracked down a few people, but both Adam and I are convinced that there are lots more people out there than we've spoken to. Um, so if you know your listeners and your viewers know of these people, please come forward and, and reach out to one of us. Okay. We, uh, we tend to run into people uh, all the time from different places and spaces. And we're right here by the border. Uh, and, you know, the 405 runs right up and down. So, you know, it's like a quarter. So we tend to, our law enforcement tends to catch a lot of people uh, with uh, fentanyl um, tra trafficking it throughout the United States. But we can definitely help you with that. I will actually look into it further uh, uh, with our team and see who we can identify. We have a lot of volunteers that have been um, previous users that are now um, recovering. So we can we can tap into them. Um, let me ask you, what drives you? What drives you to do this work? Uh, start with Deborah. I mean, I've been in Mexico for 20 years. Um, organized crime and the impact of the drug war has always been a major part of my beat. Um, I also believe that the market for mind altering substances is probably one of the oldest in the world and people are always want to get, gonna want to do it. And I, I think that people should be allowed to do it safely. Um, and so I, I take probably a, a pretty, you know, my, my, my attitude to the drug war is that it's not really working and, you know, um, prohibition and uh, criminalization uh, is not saving lives. It's not, reducing the amount of drugs that people want to take. Like I truly believe that people should be able to um, take drugs safely. Um, and so the more information and the more we understand about the way that both the cartels and the drug war works and, and drug consumption habits play out, um, I think the more we can sort of move towards less human suffering at the end of the day. That's what, that's what motivates my work. And certainly when Adam told me about his organization and the and the the trip he was planning, that seemed like a good opportunity to do that. Okay. Well, what about Adam? What motivates you? Uh, well, you know, I uh, I kind of noticed this issue back in 2011, um, but back then it wasn't fentanyl that we were we were concerned about. It was like synthetic cathinones or bath salts in uh, MDMA. And, you know, I just noticed how widespread this issue was and how many how many issues people were having. And it, it seemed like a pretty simple thing to be able to just kind of step in between interactions that are happening between a drug user and a drug dealer and bring some, you know, amount of truth or honesty to that interaction through the use of test kits, you know, just allowing people to, um, to stand up for themselves and to, make better choices generally. And, you know, this has progressed quite a lot since then with the, you know, the fentanyl epidemic, of course, being a huge issue. And, and we've, um, you know, we've put our focus there and just, you know, trying to keep as many people uh, healthy and happy and, uh, and safe as possible. Wow, that, that's great motivation. Uh, we here, we um, uh, have parents on our board. We deal with different parent groups that have lost children uh, adult children and uh, young children to fentanyl poisonings. So um, it, it, that doesn't motivate people to like uh, yourselves to um, get rid of this. And I know we're not going to get rid of it, but I would like to see a big dent in what's going on before the next generation comes up, you know, yeah. 
Uh, we have it now. Now we got to deal with it. I don't know if it's going to get better. I don't know if it's going to get safer. Will we ever go back to time in like the 70s and 60s where people, you know, use recreational drugs without any issues, I, you know, you know, major issues, you know, I don't know, but it's pretty scary out there. I want to thank you guys for coming on and talking about this. Um, I want you to tell people how they can uh, follow you and find you on social media. Uh, sure. Uh, so we're at Bunk Police on you know, all the different social media outlets. You can also find us at bunkpolice.com. And I would like to point out for the people out there that can't just abstain from purchasing these substances, um, you know, at these Mexican pharmacies, there are people that will need other resources. And there are test kits available, uh, fentanyl test kits, also methamphetamine test kits. You can test Xanax to make sure it doesn't have fentanyl in it. And you can also send pills off for laboratory analysis here in the U.S. through organizations like Drugs Data and also overseas for more thorough analysis through organizations like Energy Control. That's great information. And, and Deborah, what about you? Where can they find you? I mean, they can see me on, I'm, I'm on the Vice News platforms or I'm D. Bonello on Instagram and Mexico Reporter on Twitter. So plenty, plenty of places. You can't miss me. Well, thank you so much again for joining us today. Um, this is a really interesting uh, story. We will be following you in, in your documentary. When should we expect to see the documentary? When will it be out? Mm, that's a good question. I don't know. As soon as possible. Yeah, okay. Soon. Okay. All right. Well, guys, um, thank you all out there for watching and listening. Our show is live every Thursday at 2 p.m. Uh, except when we have moments like this where it's pre-recorded, but mostly we are live. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram and Twitter. We're at Fentanyl Soul. And our website is fentanylsolution.org. Be sure to leave a comment and rate our podcast. And until next time, remember, you are the solution and take care. Thank you for joining us on this journey of awareness and compassion. Together, we can make a difference. This has been Fentanyl Solution, advocating for lives, inspiring change. Stay safe and remember, you are the